Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Spiros Economides, and I'm a, a co-chair of LISI, the LSE's research unit on Southeast Europe. And I welcome you to this webinar this afternoon, uh, which is on the very important topic of nationalism in Southeast Europe today. We have an extremely eminent group of panelists who are going to be introduced in a second by my friend and colleague, Professor Jasna Dragovic Soso, who will be uh, chairing this afternoon's event. But before handing over to Jasna, could I just make a few uh, administrative announcements? The first is that um, this is a, uh, a recording, this is a, a webinar which is being recorded and will be later put on our website as a podcast for those of you who are interested in following it later on. Uh, we are also streaming on Facebook and those of you who are participating, participating on Facebook can put questions through the comment sections, we will pick them up and they will be put to our panelists. For those of you watching uh, on the Zoom link, uh, please keep in mind that there is a Q&A, a question and answer function at the bottom of the screen. When uh, the Q&A session starts at the end of the panelists' presentations, please use that feature to ask your questions and provide a name and an affiliation, otherwise your question may not be taken. And those of you who feel obliged to tweet, the uh, Twitter handle you can use today is hashtag LSE Balkans. Again, welcome to this afternoon's webinar. And now could I please hand you over to uh, the chair of this afternoon's uh, meeting, uh, Professor uh, Jasna Dragovic Soso, who's a professor of international politics and history at Goldsmiths College, but is also a visiting professor at the European Institute at the London School of Economics. Jasna. Thank you very much, Spiros. Um, so as Spiros said, the topic of this evening's round table is nationalism in Southeastern Europe today. And um, as attested by the events of the last several years in the region, as well as more recently, uh, this topic is both an important and a burning one. To mention briefly, just in the last few months, we have seen the resurgence of controversies about the Second World War and about the wars of the 1990s in a variety of cultural products, media, publications, and public exchanges. There have also been renewed calls for partition and territorial exchanges in the region, and of course, the continuing official rehabilitation of convicted war criminals. During the last decade, we have also witnessed the crisis of liberalism in the West, in the United States and the EU, which was accompanied by forms of nationalism and nationalist discourses that many had viewed as the preserve of the Balkan other. And I think this in turn begs the question of how unique nationalism in Southeast Europe really is and what we can learn from it more generally. So our panel this evening to discuss this topic is comprised of three very illustrious academics who are longstanding analysts of the politics, the history and the sociology of the region, as well as authors of important books on nationalism. Florian Bieber is Professor of Southeast European History and Politics and Jean Monnet Chair at the University of Graz, where he's also the Director of the Center for Southeast European Studies. Florian is also the Coordinator of the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group, known under the acronym BIEPAG, which is a widely consulted source of information about the region. His most recent books, both published in 2020, are Debating Nationalism with Bloomsbury and the Rise of Authoritarianism in the Western Balkans with Palgrave. And he is also the author of many other publications on Southeast European politics and society. He has a further book coming out with Palgrave in 2021, co-authored with Roland Bieber called Negotiating Unity and Diversity in the European Union. Dan Jovic is Professor of Political Science at the University of Zagreb and visiting professor at the University of Belgrade. Between 2010 and 2014, he was chief political analyst to the president of the Republic of Croatia. Dejan is the author of Yugoslavia, a state that withered away with Purdue University Press and Rat i Mit, War and Myth, Politics of Identity in Croatia, which was published in Croatian with Fraktura in 2017 quickly sold out and is now in its second edition. Earlier this year, it received the Kronoslav Sukic Award for Book of the Decade in Croatia. Until recently, Dejan was the editor-in-chief of the Croatian Political Science Review, Politička Misao, 
and is now the editor of Tragovi Footprints, Journal for Serbian, Serbian and Croatian Issues. Sinisha Malesevic is full professor and chair of sociology at the University College Dublin. He is a senior fellow at Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers in Paris, and currently a research fellow at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study in the Humanities and Social Sciences in Amsterdam. He is an elected member of the Royal Irish Academy and the Academia Europea. His recent books include Contemporary Sociological Theory with Stephen Loyal, which came out last October, his 2019 book, Grounded Nationalisms, a Sociological Analysis, and his 2017 book, The Rise of Organized Brutality, a Historical Sociology of Violence, both with Cambridge University Press. The Rise of Organized Brutality won the American Sociological Association's Outstanding Book Award in 2018, and Grounded Nationalisms was a runner-up for the 2020 Steen Rocken Prize for the Comparative Social Science Research. Sinisha is the author of 10 books, eight edited volumes, and over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters, and his work has been translated into 13 languages. I'm absolutely delighted they have accepted our invitation to take part in this discussion, and without further ado, I turn over to Florian. Well, thank you, Yasna, uh, for having us uh, putting this panel together. And your, this is your brainchild. And um, also for Spiros and LSE for organizing and hosting us, even though it would have been nicer to be at LSE at this moment than um, virtually. Um, and also, of course, I mean, I, I guess it's, it, I'm happy about the invitation, not happy about the, the, the causes, which Yasna, you've outlined already so, so kind of succinctly why we're talking about this particular topic. Um, so, you know, I, I wish we could move away or have a purely historical debate about nationalism in Southeastern Europe and not one where we have to deal with the contemporary. So this is in a certain way, not a very fortunate uh, theme we'll have to engage with today. And I mean, the first step I would like to say is that you know, I don't see you know, anything specific to Southeastern Europe when we're talking about nationalism. I mean, of course, there are particular specificities in terms of uh, historical historical references, uh, political dynamics in the present, but the overall phenomena is, of course, nothing unique and nothing special. And I think this is one a very important one, especially as we're discussing a particular region that we have to also be aware not to fall into the trap of uniqueness and specificity and rather recognize that the phenomena we're looking at have their historical record uh, in the region, but are not, um, are not limited to it. And I mean, yes, as you already said, you know, we, we are we are first of all in an environment where certain expressions of nationalism uh, and uh, have become more common in a number of countries. Um, and you know, I think first of all, maybe the question of, of of defining what we're talking about, because the problem in this is, I mean, Sinisha has worked on this extensively. The way in which we just understand nationalism, and you know it has these multiple layers there are these dimensions of nationalism which is the everyday the banal nationalism the flying the flag the the uh, by british by american and so on which uh, is ubiquitous and and quite different in terms of intensity and exclusion than the more kind of violent exclusionary types of nationalism so First of all, I would like to say that this other type of national is present in many societies kind of nearly constantly as we're living in a nation, nationwide organized world. Um, but the question is really more the kind of exclusionary and potentially virulent nationalism we're talking about. So nationalisms which are uh, which are explicitly excluding and emphasizing the exclusionary dimension and which are also potentially either violent or highly politicized and highly polarizing. So this is how I would narrow it down. So of course, this is something we've seen globally on the rise. And I would, uh, you know, and I've, I've, I've looked at this on a global scale. I think it's of course impossible to say there's a single global picture. The world is too diverse luckily to, to allow for such a global assessment. We've seen it mostly rise in European countries in North America with some traces elsewhere like in India. Um, but of course, very often we have to, and, I, and I've argued that it's very hard to disentangle the reinforcement of nationalism with authoritarianism and populism. And I think they are form a triad uh, which really work together and are mutually reinforcing. So sometimes 
nationalist politicians are not elected because they're nationalist. They're not elected because they're authoritarian, but they might use both strategies as ways to uh, retain power and influence. Um, so, and of course, the causes are not nationalism itself. I mean, we know this very well from the studies of the 1990s Yugoslav wars, that nationalism did not emerge, that it wasn't the cause, but it was more the consequence of something else, uh, of a uh, erosion of legitimacy, erosion of state, a crisis of a, of a ruling system in many ways. Uh, and nationalism is not the cause, but the consequence. And I think also here now in today's world, nationalism is maybe a consequence, it's not a cause by itself. Um, it's caused by a multitude of, of factors, which uh, is, is very hard to kind of capture in a single, in a single description. And I think what we're, what we're dealing with is that some of the global phenomena we're seeing manifest in Southeastern Europe. Um, and they, of course, manifest in something which, uh, which is the past, which has not been fully dealt with. And, uh, you know, the, the wars of the 1990s and the Second World War uh, are resources of which uh, are talked about in a highly controversial and contested, uh, in a certain way, historical events. And unfortunately, the period between the wars themselves and the present have not sufficed and have not uh, kind of led to the processes necessary to um, deal with them. And this means that now you can have the rehabilitation of war criminals, you can have uh, a constant reminder of the antagonisms of war, you can have hate speech in newspapers, and all of the kind of hallmarks which we observed before the wars in the 1990s are witnessable uh, in following public debates uh, in the post yugoslav space today. Um, now, and I think Dan might speak more to that because he's, this book, Ratimit, is, is, I think, very extensively devoted and an excellent study on that topic. But I think just to kind of have it as an introductory uh, thoughts um, is very much that this is still, it's not just that it is still present. I mean, I, I would say in many ways the past is still present in the region, but it's not that it's just still, but it's if more present. So it's not a constant, but it's becoming more present, I find, in recent years in the public discourse, in the antagonism. And we could talk about many examples, the way in which Oluya is discussed in Serbia, for example, um, the way in which uh, we, we see also the glorification, for example, of, um, of the army, this, the Yugoslav army in the Kosovo war through a number of movies. Um, um, and these kind of celebrations, commemorations, popular culture are all pulling in a similar direction, which is a, a, a very nationalist, one-sided view, and one which is also now consumed by a new generation who have not experienced either Yugoslavia or the wars of the 1990s in any substantial way. And so this is really a context which, of course, we have to be careful. I think there's a, you know, people were thinking in the 90s or bef before the wars of the 90s, often through the lens of earlier conflicts. And we have to be careful not to think of the present through the lens of the exclusively of the 1990s. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't uh, argue in any way that there is a, a threat of a recurrence of the violence of the 1990s. So we shouldn't fall into the trap to, you know, see conflict and nationalism in an exclusionary way exclusively through the lens of past experience. But um, I think what we can say is that this kind of polarization and the difficulty of having any kind of substantial, meaningful debate about it. Um, this is, I think, the space. I mean, of course, there are the groups of people who are having these debates. I mean, you know, we are having this debate, and there are many excellent historians and social scientists who are having those debates. Those networks exist, but they did exist in the 80s as well, in the early 90s as well. So it's not that that the presence of these networks uh, uh, is is in itself a, a defense against. The, the, the malign effects of exclusionary uh, and radical nationalism, but rather that that is the one which is more visible in media, uh, uh, the, the kind of nationalist, uh, kind of very, very uh, ideological, dogmatic uh, historians or scholars are often more present in the public sphere. And I think this is again where we're coming about, the, we have to discuss that nationalism is often a, not a cause, but a result of something else, a permissible media environment, authoritarian tendencies in the region. So I think we cannot talk about 
a nationalism as being as being uh, the, the, in a certain way caused, but rather that it's triggered by a number of phenomena which come together: the weakening of the liberal European, in a certain way, post-war order, um, uh, especially in Southeastern Europe, uh, the the, liber the kind of declining attraction of liberal democracy as an ideological political model. Um, with it combined the declining attractiveness of the European Union and the fact that there are, of course, other ideas of Europe. I mean, we have an idea of Europe as promoted by people like Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, which is a Europe of nation states, which is anti-Muslim, which is anti-immigration, which is uh, defined on uh, the kind of anti-moralis Christianitatis or the uh, defense wall from the Southeast ideology. And this is another vision of Europe, which is competing, not just in Hungary, but is competing on a European level, and one which resonates, uh, picks up themes from Southeastern Europe, and again, feeds to the region uh, these ideas. So in that sense, um, the region is deeply communicated, mm -hmm. deeply Europeanized when we're talking about nationalism and exchanging ideas with it. So much for now, and then I think we can uh, continue the conversation later on. Thank you. Dan, would you like to continue? Yes, why not? Thanks so much, Jasna. And thanks for the invitation to the LSE. I would start by saying that, in fact, um, in the last 30 years, and this is 2021, therefore 30 years since 1991, this crucial year for the post-Yugoslav um, area. In these 30 years, I think nationalism has been consolidated and I think shaped um, in a way in which it now represents and actually signifies, and it is a much more um, stronger uh, political occurrence or a political phenomena, uh, more clearly defined. And I would say with more powerful uh, instruments to um, achieve its main objectives than it used to be back in 1991. Maybe this, um, I think maybe this conclusion or a tentative conclusion might come as a surprise because we all remember, of course, 1991 and how violent these years were and how we felt that actually this was also due to uh, strong and violent uh, nationalisms. But I think we shouldn't really confuse the violence, uh, which in this particular case was result, in my view, of chaotic and anarchic nature um, of the uh, international order, or at least the international order in this part of Europe, after its collapsing with 1989, um, in fact, with um, a nationalism, with a strength of, of nationalism. I think nationalism was um, rather uh, disorganized and uh, I would say confused somehow, if I may use this word for something that is a doctrine and, and ideology. Um, and therefore, if you look, for example, the uh, main um, advocates or proponents or actors that uh, acted, acted on behalf of the state or a nation, I think what we actually can see in the 1990s, especially the first half of the 1990s, that they, they were full of ideas uh, which kept changing with time um, that could not define either the concept of a nation or a state uh, that couldn't really define the objectives of uh, national politics uh, when it comes to their uh, new, newly, uh, newly created nation states. And I think that they, they were pretty much just like many others in a general public, confused and surprised with the um, series of events that actually happened in uh, 1990, 1991 in former Yugoslavia. Um, when it comes to general public, I think we we have the evidence of this in uh, various uh, public opinion polls done in 1990, but also in the uh, voting behavior in 1990. Um, we could uh, challenge actually the, the notion that there was a very strong desire for independence um, for their own separate nation state um, from Yugoslavia. Um, I think we could certainly argue that this desire for independence by 1990 was already strong and uh, clearly articulated in Slovenia. But when it comes to uh, North Macedonia, as it is called now, or Montenegro or Bosnia and Slovenia, um, I, I couldn't actually, I don't remember a very strong desire um, on the side either of political elites of these countries or general public 
for independence. And if you don't have a strong desire for independence or to create your own nation state, then of course the question is what is the character of the of nationalism? Is this really a national? Is this really nationalism? And what are we actually talking about nationalism um, when you uh, when there is no uh, clear desire um, for statehood or for independence? Uh, when it comes to Serbia, uh, some might be surprised. I mean, because they, of course there is a lot of discussion about the strength of Serbian nationalism. It's certainly uh, Serbian political actions in the 1990s were clearly, uh, they also involved violence and a lot of violence, but um, Serbia did not declare independence uh, ever, actually. It, re it became independent in 2006, um, largely due to Montenegrin uh, desire for independence after all these previous uh, declarations of uh, independence back in uh, 19, from in the period from 1991 um, onwards. And uh, the similar thing is with Croatia in which, um, for example, now we are, I think in May 21, there will be 30 years exactly of the um, rather well-known referendum on independence which involved in the recent, in the question, in, in, the, in the referendum question also, some other options, such as, for example, a possibility for a new confederation between Croatia and other uh, nation states. Therefore, I would say that actually, you know, back in the 1990s, despite the violence, um, I think there is some space to challenge whether actually this uh, Southeast European or post-Yugoslav nationalisms were either strong or organized or well-defined. And I think we see this, the, I think the line of events on the ground during this war, uh, you could e easily see that actually there is a confusion of a, a question of uh, you know, where exactly should be the state and who exactly is the nation and what do we mean by um, the, um, the borders, for example, of the new states. I mean, do we, do we accept um, the existing borders as they used to be in socialist Yugoslavia or want to change it? And who, who do we actually see as belonging to um, the collective us? I mean, there are very good articles, of course, on this, uh, largely through the prism of the, um, of the citizenship uh, policies and the policies on, on citizenship. I think uh, now, however, 30 years uh, since, what we see is, I think, uh, much better defined nationalisms in post Yugoslav states. And the, the reason for this is not only that there are 30 years in between, um, and therefore they had enough time, I think, to organize themselves and to think of what is a nation and where is the border and whether it could be changed and who belongs to us and the others, but also it is due to, I think, several other factors. First of all, in some cases, some of these confused uh, nationalisms um, that needed a war to strengthen the key elements of uh, us and the other, of the otherness and the self, um, they got uh, uh, actually, to their own surprise, rather successful. Uh, they used um, well, circumstances and support that they um, uh, got they uh, they got from from abroad from the external uh, actors of the time and uh, for example i mean i first of all i have in mind slovenian case um so in which for example when slovenia even declared independence i mean we all remember that nobody recognized it for um a six or seven months and it took the war in croatia basically to um for slovenia to gather, to gather recognition. Therefore, this external support for independence certainly strengthened and made very successful Slovenian uh, nationalism and the idea of independence from Yugoslavia. Um, the same or a similar cases, of course, with Croatia, which um, was which is a country in which I think we can we can talk uh, we can see that nationalism, of course, was also very successful, and it was successful not only in terms of keeping the borders. Uh, receiving independence uh, against odds uh, in uh, January 1992, um, but also uh, achieving uh, a high degree of ethnic homogenization uh, in 1995 in uh, particular. Um, all of this with support from the outside. And uh, it is a very big question, of course, whether the indigenous or the original and uh, domestic forces would have been 
powerful enough and organized enough to um, achieve uh, any of these uh, particular successes. Now, um, the uh, other thing that motivates uh, current nationalisms, so apart from successes, are failures. Um, and failures are many and uh, primarily are related to the states and nations whose political leaders seem to be um, uh, dissatisfied with the results of the war of the 1990s. Those who believe, for example, that the borders um, in which they uh, were left with their own states or the uh, definition of the nation with which they are, uh, they are, they are now uh, being left uh, is um, unsatisfactory. And um, I think there, apart from Croatia, from Slovenia, and to a degree Croatia, we have a number of um, dissatisfied uh, states um, who actually are uh, hoping for, I think, a new, basically a new opportunity. And they um, link their hopes with um, a, a, an expectation that one day, sooner or later, there might be uh, another collapsing of international order and therefore perhaps another uh, uh, rebalancing of powers, of external powers over and in the Western Balkans. And therefore that these nationalisms are um, also promoting the idea of frozen conflict, for example, the sense of being victims, being excluded, not being understood, uh, not being supported to the same degree to which, for example, the other, some other nationalisms have. I think the other thing that feeds somehow nationalism in Southeast Europe is the popularity of sovereignism uh, globally and especially in the European Union, in particular, I think in the uh, European inner periphery, internal periphery, therefore in countries of former Eastern Europe for which actually I'm not entirely sure that now 30 and more years since 1989, we can say that their motivation for 1989 was primarily liberal. I think in many of these cases, actually the primary motivation was nationalist, was, anti, was uh, to return, was an idea of returning sovereignty from Soviet Union back home somehow. And I think the cases of Hungary and Poland show, show that they show that in fact, you know, I wonder whether the, in, in, whether the initial inspiration for 1989 in these countries was liberalism. I think it was more actually nationalism in these cases, just like in Slovenia, but unlike in the other part of uh, former Yugoslavia. And then thirdly, I think what we see is uh, the sense of uh, unfinished businesses in uh, Western uh, Balkans. And in particular, I have in mind three issues which introduce a degree of uncertainty. And uncertainty is always good because with uncertainty, you need to give some response, you need to reassure people, you need to show the way uh, how to deal with challenges that are inevitable in, in the future. Uh, these three uncertainties, I would call uncertainty about disintegration, uncertainty about reintegration, and uncertainty about integration. Now, uncertainty about disintegration uh, refers to the um, disintegration of Yugoslavia. Is this process now over or not? Um, is six or seven post-Yugoslav states um, all? Or is this process still um, ongoing? And can we expect fear and hope, depending on where we stand in political scale, that this process will continue? with disintegration of uh, further disintegration that would lead to that would lead to more states in former Yugoslavia. The second thing is related to issue of reintegration, reintegration of post Yugoslav republics, now independent states, of which uh, several had actually disintegrated at the same time when Yugoslavia did disintegrate. You know, we sometimes forget that it actually, it was not only disintegration of Yugoslavia in 1991, it was a disintegration of Bosnia and of Croatia and of Serbia. And now we also have disintegration of Kosovo, which, which is the fact whose borders, the Jure borders are not the same as de facto borders. So I think all of them had to face some challenge of uh, being reintegrated. And in those cases where there is external support for integration, it has happened to a degree. Whether this degree is now sufficient 
that we can say that the process is over, or whether it is still a process that is ongoing, that's a big question again. And I think the domestic nationalisms are very much focused on the issue of whether there should be more integration of Bosnia or less integration, whether there should be integration of Kosovo into Serbia, whether it should be integration of North Kosovo into, into Kosovo, and whether there should be some kind of integration locally into a kind of a new Yugoslavia called Mini Schengen. These questions are now really at a, in the focus of domestic uh, nationalisms. And they, of course, differ very much on how they respond to some of uh, these uh, questions. Here, we also have the issue of disintegration and reintegration of nations, yeah, which are now divided by new uh, state borders and within which there are also significant differences even within the same nation on, a, on particular key political issues. For example, those Serbs who now live in Croatia and those Serbs who uh, now live in Serbia, uh, you know, there's a big question whether this is one nation or two nations. And the same issue we have with Albanians in Kosovo and Albanians in Albania and so on and so forth. So we really have a serious question of whether there is still one nation. In some cases, such as for example, with Bosnian Muslims, um, who are now in many cases divided into Bosniaks and Muslims with capital M, we actually have disintegration of a nation um, after the nation had changed the name in 1993. So is this still one nation or two nations? What happened with Bunyevci and Croats and so on and so forth? So we are reopening some of these issues which are still feeding nationalisms because they produce uncertainties. And finally, the final, the third point, that uh, is the focal point for nationalism is an issue of integration in European Union. This process now looks like waiting for Godot um, and waiting for the train that will not come. And so for as long as that, this is the case, there is a strong sense of unfairness, inequality, exclusion, and to a degree humiliation. Very good words and concepts for strengthening nationalist rhetorics and practices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, and I hand over to Sinisha. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Jasna, for organizing this event and also to LSC for hosting it. Uh, Dan and Florian have focused more on the kind of political aspects of, of nationalism in the region and being sociologists myself, particularly historical sociologists, I want to kind of take a little bit long term view of these changes, uh, focusing more on societies, because obviously nationalism is not just political doctrine, it's also a way of living, uh, something that is embedded very much in the institutions and uh, everyday life. So I see nationalism in that sense as a historical phenomenon that develops and changes through time and space. And in order to understand what's happening now, we really have to look at these historical trajectories. They do make important uh, 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 tracts in, in, in understanding where we are now. So, so in that sense, I think nationalism uh, is not only about agency and political elites and political parties, it's also about a structure. It's a structural phenomenon. So structural context make nationalism possible and durable without structures, without organizations, without kind of ideological penetration nationalism would evaporate. So in that sense, we have to look at a little bit more at the kind of broader issue of, of how these trajectories uh, change. It is also important for us to bear in mind, and, and Florian has talked a little bit about this, this is a global phenomenon. It is something that has been developing for the last 250 years. So in, in many respect, respects, nationalism is a meta ideology of modernity it has become very hegemonic in that sense, uh, particularly after the Second World War. I mean, we live in a world of nation states, there are no empires anymore. There are no patrimonial kingdoms. There are no uh, kind of city states. Everything else has been delegitimized. So as long as you live in a nation state, nationalism will always be there. It's, it's not easy to kind of, because this is the way how nation states legitimize themselves. Uh, so, so, so in that context, uh, we can take a look a little bit at the kind of uh, Southeast Europe and, and what, what uh, is kind of, to some extent, uh, uh, distinct about some, uh, Southeast Europe is that nationalism developed here very late, very late kind of in, in, in late 19th century as a sociological phenomenon. Uh, so up to now, up to that period, we have dominance of imperial structures and in, in, in many respects, uh, they were legitimized using very different ideologies. So if you look, let's say very briefly, I'll, I'll cut the jump, jump through the 19th century just to make a few points. Uh, if you look at you know, the, the, uh, how national, whether uh, there was any nationalism in the 19th century, we have to look at the way, uh, you know, how coercive organizational structures were developed and they were very underdeveloped. You know, this, this was a region that 
was very late to modernize. It had a very poor infrastructure, very uh, weak transport communication network networks. These are all important for kind of society, to link society, to link people between different villages. So once modernization started, it was very uneven. Uh, focus was very much on, on military, on police, on administrative apparatus that you know, was, was not very uh, efficient, but was very expensive. So more, much of this you know, state capacity was built, but it was quite weak for many years. So, uh, uh, and, and was very much built on the money borrowed from, from you know, West, West European states, France mostly. Uh, then if you look in, in terms of ideology, ideological penetration of nationalism in this reason, it wasn't very deep. You know, imperial legacies were much, much more powerful. Religion mattered much more. Local attachments were much stronger than nation, the clan, extended families, kinship networks, village communities. This is how people lived in everyday life. This is how they saw the world. Uh, also very important, something that, you know, most theories of nationalism emphasize, illiteracy. You know, if you don't have literacy, it's very difficult to build kind of cross class uh, identities. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, what we see here, rampant illiteracy in Serbia, for example, 19, uh, sorry, 1864, 90% of the population is still illiterate. Even at the beginning of the 20th century, 83% illiterate in Serbia. Uh, in 1930, uh, in Romania, 43% uh, of Romanian adults were illiterate. Uh, this is also a society where you don't have a kind of mass educational systems, which are key vehicle of nationalization. Uh, you don't have uh, standardized languages. You have lots of still dialects spoken. These are, these are all kind of, there are no preconditions for nationalism, no so-called high culture, you know, theaters, museums, academies, concert halls, libraries, theaters. These were all built uh, mostly mid to a, a late 19th century. So nationalism was quite weak in that sense. It was a uh, elite phenomenon, a very top-down thing. Uh, you know, it, 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 narrow social strata was receptive to nationalist ideas, state bureaucracy, police, military, intellectuals. Well, majority of society here, we are talking about 90, more than 90% were essentially peasants, uh, urban, urban poor, uh, poor uh, population. And they were not, they were either ambiguous about nationalism or quite hostile. So what we have, they were generally anti-statist, which is a legacy of the empire. Also, uh, you know, very sympathetic to uh, peasant populism. That's why you know, a number of, of peasant parties were very influential, Bulgaria and Serbia and so on. Also very religiously conservative. So all of these are not good grounds for, for kind of nationalism. So what happened in the 20th century, this is a key period for development of nationalism. This is a development of the, uh, you know, it's a develop, develop, uh, developmentalist state. Uh, whether it was a communist or anti-communist as in Turkey or Greece, they were key vehicles of modernization. So this is where people become, uh, uh, you know, kind of integrated into society when states penetrate society and when nationalism kind of has foundations. So, so what we see, uh, you know, a lot of what's happening today has uh, uh, resonates with what was happening in this time. I don't have time to go into details. I'll just switch now to the contemporary to 21st century, what's happening now. So see what, what we see now here, we have a, in terms of organizational structure, very robust, huge uh, uh, bureaucratic apparatuses, uh, but they're obviously inefficient, corrupt, nepotistic, clientist, but they're enormous. You know, uh, uh, public sector in Serbia is about 600,000 people. In Croatia, about 400,000 people. States are very centralized. Most states are very centralized. Uh, they also have decent development develop transport communication networks so the societies are integrated. So you can spread nationalist ideas throughout society much easier. They have a, a very powerful, large course of poli uh, police apparatus. Croatia, about 20,000 police officers. In 1980s, it was half of that, around 11,000. Serbia, 43,000 policemen and women. Uh, in, in, in 1980s, it was, it was uh, about 16,000. Even Bosnia has a, a lot of you know, huge police force uh, uh, in, in terms of numbers. Uh, about 17,000 and it was about 8,000 in the 1980s. Uh, so, so what we see is, is a big state, you know, kind of huge state, but not very functional state, obviously. Uh, and uh, it's, it, you know, in, in some sense, state can penetrate society. So that's an important element for, for uh, proliferation nationalism. Second issue is the kind of ideological uh, uh, spread of, of nationalist ideas. And here, literacy has been achieved. Nearly all Balkan states have achieved full literacy. 99% Croatia, Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, around 98, even Bosnia, about 97. So these are, uh, these are preconditions for, for nationalism to spread easily. We have standardized languages. There was obviously re-standardization in 1990s in much of the former Yugoslavia. Cultural production, very uh, present, which is important in terms of so-called high culture that you, you can kind of uh, 
uh, generate these nation-centric uh, ideas and mythologies about nation. Primary, secondary education compulsory, mostly it's a key channel for, for nationalization, socialization of young people to become aware of who they are and become, you know, in that sense. Then we have something that Dan has analyzed in his works, you know, commemorations of previous wars, national tragedies, you know, every other day there is a commemoration, you know, and, and this kind of constantly reminds you that you are Croat, you are Serb, you are Albanian, whoever you are. So this reinforces nation-centric views of present and past. Uh, but what's also important here is that, uh, and, and uh, uh, I think Dan has also mentioned that to some extent in Florian, uh, there is also deep ideological polar polarization. So nationalism is, is, is widespread, but it's also deeply polarized. So there is no consensus on the legacy of the Second World War, there is no consensus on period of state socialism in the communist parts of former communist part of the Balkans, no consensus of the war in the 1990s. And I'm talking about within the societies. Obviously, they, there is no consensus between societies because they fought each other. But within societies, uh, there is a deep ideological polarization, which also provides vehicle for nationalist outbidding within different groups. So, so you can use constantly these elements to you know, kind of e e e emphasize your nationalism. And here, I'm not just talking about far right you can have a left version as well, because everybody can use these discourses to, to make kind of nationalist claims. And nationalism, in some respect, is the key mechanism for you to, le to legitimize yourself to the to wider audience. Then we see also divides in terms of uh, generational divides. Younger people are mostly, you know, have problems finding jobs and, and emigrating. They're also more influenced by world trends. And uh, there is a division between urban and huge, huge division, urban and rural areas deep inequalities in what are essentially very impoverished societies with small middle classes. So we, that's why we have a you know, huge uh, emigration brain drain, you know, half of the population of Boston lives outside of Bosnia. And this is the more educated part, for example. Uh, so, so obviously impoverished populations seem to be more leaning towards exclusive uh, nationalism. Then, you know, some of the issues that have been raised by Florian and, uh, as well, you know, uh, uh, importance of mass media, private mass media, that are often controlled indirectly by political parties uh, and then can periodically invoke certain kind of extremist uh, 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 content, especially before the elections. But that's also done outside by the civil society, various groups within the civil society. So we see constant generation instability, production of fear, animosity, you know, tensions are kept alive constantly. And then the last element is the kind of this micro element, uh, which is also important, but hasn't been studied much and this is the kind of the way how uh, you know, micro level solidarity is linked with this organizational ideological uh, uh, grounded nationalism. And that's the kind of family life, uh, you know, the, 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 the family and friendship networks. They are very imp important in, 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 the, in this part of the world. People trust mostly their family members and friends. They don't trust the state. If you look at the various uh, surveys, there are enormously low level of trust in state and government. Uh, you know, around 20% maximum in Bosnia and Macedonia, uh, which is much lower than OCD countries or, or EU. Uh, younger people are the, the least trustful towards the state. Uh, so there is more trust, you know, kind of in reliance on these family networks of support. And we know, for example, that, uh, you know, uh, 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 Balkans have the largest number of young people living with, with the parents, this range between 18 and 35. In Montenegro, 77%, in Croatia, 75%, in Serbia, 72 compared to Norway, let's say, where it's 21%. So it's, an, you know, people are dependent on their families rather than the state. They don't trust the state. So kinship and friendship networks are very important, uh, and they are not penetrated by the state. State is distracted, seen as, as, as kind of corrupt and, you know, this other thing. So, so what we see here, we see deeply nationalized population. Most surveys show that people identify strongly with, with the nation. Uh, but they also distrust the state. So th that's also the reason why nationalism is strong. The state is, is in that sense, not, not kind of, does, has not penetrated the micro world. We, we see more nation and less state in some respects. Uh, so when we go back, you know, we see that nationalism has really increased uh, uh, profoundly over the, over the last two centuries. And, and these societies, I, I would agree with Ben in that sense, that nationalism is, is very strong in that sense, in, in that sense. But it's also uh, uh, unevenly grounded. Uh, so, so that's why it's so loud. You know, there is a good, good uh, uh, quote by uh, Mark Bessinger where he said that, you know, we should distinguish between nationalisms that bark and nationalisms that bite. This is a much more of a barking nationalism. It's very loud because it's insecure. You know, in, in that sense, uh, that, that's an important element to analyze. 
Uh, so, so I'll stop here now. I probably went over my time. <laughs> uh, thanks, yes. Well, thank you very much, um, Sinisha, Dayan, and, and Florian. Um, we're starting to get uh, questions coming in. Um, what I will do is I will take um, about three questions at a time um, and sort of summarize what the questions are uh, for you and, um, and ask uh, either the panel or individual uh, speakers uh, to speak. But before I do so, and while we're warming up uh, with the questions, um, perhaps I could just ask you a very academic question in a sense, which is um, in your view, this is to the panel, what has been the contribution of the study of nationalism in the Balkans for our general understanding of nationalism as a phenomenon? Um, I don't really mind which order you want to go in. Just a, a brief answer because we're now starting to get a lot of questions. Shall I get started then, yes. Yes, Florian. Sure, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of, I mean, I think that the scholarship of nationalism has greatly advanced in the, in the studying the Yugoslav wars of the 90s. I mean, global study and understanding. And I think a lot of the debates, uh, you know, uh, about, for example, whether nationalism is a bottom-up or top-down phenomena is something which was discussed in the context of the Yugoslav uh, conflicts. And I think this is, a lot has been learned globally on, uh, on that. And I think all of us have, you know, done our own research on the Yugoslav uh, case. And I mean, Sinisha more than all of us gl globalized or taken the lessons global in many way or studied in a larger context. I think, and I think this is important. My point is also that we should study uh, what is in the, you know, nationalism in any particular part of the world, be it in Southeastern Europe, in a global context and, and try to learn the lessons for, for larger phenomena. So, I mean, I think the processes, uh, which also Sinisha was just pointing out now are global, you know, whether it's the literacy, whether it is the, the mechanisms in which nationalism is communicated, that it's you know very much often driven by elites, and and, and all of these are, are are not unique to any in any way to the Yugoslav context. A lot of it was studied in that context, but it's it's not specific at all. Thanks. Anyone else? Well, Dan. I think yeah, I, I think we have here a great a set of cases in in, in a way. In which we can, um, we, which we, to which we can actually apply some of these theoretical um, ideas. I mean, we, we here have, uh, you know, first of all, states that uh, appeared on a map, and as I said earlier, some of them without even their population expected them or hoping it would happen or even knowing what to do with them. And actually, their weakness to a large degree is a consequence of this confusion and suddenness of historical events which were which hit uh, the population in, in uh, Southeast Europe. But then we also have the attempts of the um, uh, identity designers, as I call them, um, to shape and organize the nation and, and, and to uh, sell the size of the state and uh, the history of the nation and the history of the state to the general population with more or less success. And that's what they have been doing in the last 30 years. And as a result of this, as I said earlier, I think we now have much more consolidated nationalisms than they used to be back in the 1990s. In the 1990s, I mean, as for example, VP Gagnon said, I mean, the myth of ethnic war, you know, books like that, I think very seriously, and I think uh, they were quite right in pointing out that actually this, the interpretation that these wars were primarily ethnic uh, should, be ch should, should be challenged. And, and, uh, and I think they were right. And, and the part of this was because there were also other motivations, many other motivations for people to commit violence in, in the war. And I mean, this, this is something that goes back to violence in wars in general, I think. I mean, we, we have now very good books on Berholtz, for example, on the Second World War violence, which you know, we also used to treat as inter-ethnic and inter-ideological, but in fact, there were very many other motives and circumstances. And I think that is something that we should also take from the Yugoslav studies uh, forward and then uh, obviously apply to some other cases if they are similar and certainly they are in comparative politics. Thank you. Okay, uh, maybe I can jump as well. I, I think that there's a lot of that we have learned uh, that has, has kind of impacted the nationalism studies from, from this region. Historically, you know, there are all these kind of recent debates on 
national indifference and kind of the legacies of empire and the relationship between imperialism and nationalism, which are much more complex than they traditionally, you know, traditionally we would just see imperialism and nationalism as mutually exclusive. And now we see that there's much more commonality. Then obviously the, the, the state socialist period and, and the relationship with nationalism has been also kind of questioned and analyzed before you would think, you know, again, traditional conventional understanding was you know, uh, communist, uh, communism was very anti-nationalist, but in reality, you, you know, it was much more subtle, more complex relationship. Uh, and, and then obviously, the, you know, the point that was made by Florian and Dan about the legacies of the, of the wars of the 1990s have also impacted on, on recent debates and, you know, discussions of nationalism. So I think we, we can learn a great deal from the region of, and, and contribute to kind of general debate. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start trying to um, gather questions now. Um, and I will start at the beginning. We have an interesting question from uh, Liridonia Velu uh, from Dublin City University. Um, she's a PhD student currently in Illinois. And this is the US question to all speakers. She says, um, most recent academic trends have touched upon race in the Balkans. They claim that looking at the region through the predominant lens of nation nationalism is a reductionist endeavor. What is your view on this? And which, if any phenomena in the Balkans would you consider as best viewed from a racist rather than a nationalist lens? Anyone want to have a go? I mean, I, I can have a first stab. I mean, I think there's Catherine Baker's, of course, excellent book on that topic, which kind of really the first study, which brings the debate to the region a few years ago. And, but I, you know, I think, I think it's not that you know each lens gives a each lens is a lens it gives a focus on what we study so I think I think the study of race or the lens of race is a good supplement to the study of nationalism it's not a replacement for it and I think we can't look at relations amongst nations as through the lens of race I think that's not very helpful I mean there are some relations in the Balkans which are studied helpfully through the lens of race I think the, the, the view of mainstream societies of Roma communities, for example, I think is helpful to introduce the concept of race there because it's not just of national difference or distinctiveness. Sometimes the relations among between South Slavs and Albanians as well have a, a, a racialized uh, undertones. Uh, and I think there it's very useful to include that to uh, realize that it's not just about nationalism, but there is a racialized kind of dimension to all of that. And then there's a larger question of, you know, how does a place like a European, you know, states which were not imperial um, position themselves in these larger debates about colonialism and post-colonialism is an interesting debate. But again, all of these are supplements or rather different perspectives, but I don't think they can replace the importance of, of nations and the study of nationalisms, um, uh, but they're rather just another, another uh, angle to, to study the region. Thank you. Anyone else want to weigh in on race or should we move on to to other aspects. Okay, um, all right. I have a, a question here from uh, Sven Milikic, uh, Maynus and uh, Zagreb, uh, a PhD student from both. And he has a question for uh, Dan and uh, Sinisha. Um, his question is, are nationalisms from ex-Yugoslav states actually a bit more formulated result of ethno-federalism as Crawford described it, political elites that used mobilization in their republics to gain political power and controls over limited resources. And then for uh, Dan, is there a possibility that in those service in Cro surveys in Croatia from, the from 1990, the questions regarding state independence and inter-ethnic relations, surveyed citizens answered what they thought they should respond, a kind of self-censorship. And finally, um, a question for all, will virulent ethno-nationalisms in ex-Yugoslav states ever transform into more of a Western type banal nationalism or will militaristic forms of nationalism prevail in the long run? And this ties into a question from Vesna Popovsky um, who uh, uh, says, um, didn't the political elite define uh, na the nation through the ethnic optic and therefore was it not confused for Dan? And finally, um, uh, Will Bartlett from Lisi asks, uh, does rising income, income inequality in the nation states of the 
Southeastern Europe delegitimize the national project and nationalism rather than strengthening it. And this I would um, address to uh, Sinisha in particular. Okay, since I seem to, to get um, two or three questions, if I may um, just try to briefly answer. Um, the, the first one is on um, ethno-federalism and um, organization of a nation and nationalism in socialist Yugoslavia. Uh, yes, I think the socialist Yugoslavia, in fact, certainly was not a nation state and it was not, it didn't aim at becoming a nation state. Um, instead, it was um, a specific a form of, uh, of political uh, organization uh, based around and founded around the ideology that involved, as you know, the concept of withering away of the state. And, but it also involved internationalism and it was very solidly based on the uh, Marxist and uh, in this particular case, Leninist and Stalinist interpretation of the concept of the nation and a nationhood. And uh, indeed, in as much as uh, socialist Yugoslavia was an internationalist project to some degree up until 1975 in particular, I think also with an, op with an option of being open for other members potentially or territories um, in the future should the socialist revolution happen and all these things. Um, at the same time, it also uh, recognized um, the existence of nations and gave them a kind of a quasi-state form um, through the declaring uh, the socialist republics as uh, sovereign nation states. They were not only that, they were also socio-political communities in which there, there is a self-management and everything that goes against the notion of people's and national sovereignty, but certainly in a form, it was national in the contents, it was meant to be socialist. So I suppose uh, it is therefore, uh, I think you are right if you're suggesting that in fact, this was the beginning of, uh, or at least it was this form that connected uh, the uh, national ideas from the past uh, to the 1990s. It kept the, the, the flame alive somehow during the socialist period and it served as an institutional shell uh, to organize new nation states and actually to supply it with also the cater or the kind of uh, uh, civil servants and political leaders and so on and so forth. And uh, I think therefore socialist Yugoslavia uh, did not uh, successfully eradicate nationalism. Nobody could. I mean, globalization will never defeat nationalism and nationalism will never defeat globalization. I think they will coexist always to some degree, but in this particular case, it also had space for institutionalized socialist uh, nationalism. So socialist nationalism, meaning national informed socialist in contents, right? And I think that's, that's my, that would be my guess, uh, my answer to your question. Uh, the survey, um, uh, well, you know, the, if, if it were the only source, I think we could have uh, perhaps have some uh, doubts about that. Although it, it actually was conducted in March 1990, when uh, it was an anarchic situation, nobody was in power. There was nobody to fear, um, I think, in this particular This was a brief moment in which actually uh, you had such a situation in which, you know, I don't know who to fear really in, 90, in March 1990. Uh, but uh, what actually re reaffirms the, the findings of this, of this survey, is the way the, the, the question on the referendum was formulated a year after that in May, 1991. It was quite obvious to me that unlike in Slovenia, in Croatia, the political elite did not dare to ask a simple question. Do you want Croatian independence? Yes or no. You know, the question was much more complex and much more complicated, deliberately so, because political leadership of Croatia, not even in May 1991, was sure that a question yes or no would result with a clear yes. And I think that's, for me, that's good enough. I think that, of course, the situation changes with the war and the war served also to increase the desire for independence and to eliminate any alternative, including the confederal alternative. The war was very useful for separatists. And actually it was the only way that they could actually get uh, uh, independence. Had it not been for Vukovar, I'm not sure that Slovenia would have ever been recognized internationally. The, and, and certainly, and, and Croatia would not. 
So I think without that wall, uh, which transformed the view of political um, actors abroad, I think we have a decisive, decisive change. For this re in this sense, in Croatian nationalism is quite right when they say that without the war, there will be no Croatia. There will be no independent uh, or internationally recognized uh, Croatia. And then uh, the third question was about ethnic optic in interpreting the concept of a people, but I think I've already, uh, answered, I've already said enough in responding to this, so I'm leaving, leaving this to, to other participants. Thank you. Sinish. Okay, uh, just, uh, I, I, I think I, I will answer first two. I, I, I didn't hear the third one, maybe you can remind me what, what the third one was. The first one was the uh, kind of the importance of a state socialist period. And I would argue that's, the most important period for, in sociological sense, for development of, of nation-centric understanding of the world. Despite U Yugoslav state being a, a kind of federal and, and a, a socialist, I mean, what, what Dan mentioned, you know, the, the kind of the, the Soviet idea of nationalist informed socialist in content actually worked the other way around. It, it was it was a nationalist in, in content and socialist in form. And, and we have a lot of research, obviously, in the Soviet Union and, and other kind of Czechoslovakia and other places where we see, you know, much of the kind of recent research points out how central nationalism was for legitimacy of the state. So it, it was, ne was not necessarily kind of, of an ethnic uh, form, but it was still a very much defining feature. I mean, the the Yugoslav experience of uh, fighting partisans in the Second World War, you know, you, you won the war. This was your legitimacy. Legitimacy was against the enemies, uh, others, the foreigners, and the, the domestic, uh, you know, uh, 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 traitors, essentially. So this is a language of nationalism. It, it might be a left, left wing version, but it's a nationalism nonetheless. Uh, so this was an important legitimizing uh, uh, a principle that, on which uh, you had then structural transformations that built. Uh, uh, population in, in b becoming aware that they were they were never really Yugoslav. I mean, apart from mixed families, because Yugoslav uh, communist uh, 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 party never really aspired to build a Yugoslav nation. I mean, we know that from Kardec very clearly. He was, you know, he, he, even when he was writing in, in the late thirties, you know, he he wasn't aspiring to build a Yugoslav nation. So, so in that sense, uh, we have to look at these structural changes, and that's the increased literacy rates development of, of kind of uh, uh, infrastructural capacities. We have to look at the you know, uh, creation of so-called high culture, which was you know, always national, but also in Yugoslav. So it had to be balanced. And then over the years, I mean, obviously, as you know yourself, uh, Jasne, have written about this kind of importance of intellectuals and everything else. Uh, uh, so, so nationalism was always there. You know, there was no, you know, it, the idea was to kind of try and control it rather than to abolish it. You couldn't abolish it because this is the way how all nation states, and I would disagree with Dan here, Yugoslavia was not nation state, not in terms of ethnic nationalism, but it was not an empire. So we live in a world where the, the, the only entity that is legitimate is a nation state. Internally, how it's organized, it's a different thing. It could be a federal state, it could be anything like that. But the principle is there. It's not that, that you have one nation in a state. You have the idea that you know, Yugoslavia is represented in international uh, affairs as, as one entity. So the fact that it's internally diverse and the federal doesn't matter because it's not an empire, it's not a patrimonial kingdom, it's not a city state, it is a nation state, but not a, a national state, not a nationally homogeneous state. So, so that, that period is very important. And, you know, that's why we have these legacies, uh, you know, in the 90s. It wouldn't happen if we did this, did not, uh, wasn't the case. You wouldn't, you know, we had all these national academies and things like that. Uh, the second point was about banal and and kind of nationalism and uh, I mean, the, the problem is some people think the banal nationalism is not aggressive nationalism. That's not the case. I mean, if you read uh, Billig, you know, he's very clear, you know, that this is a, precisely because this nationalism is reproduced on everyday basis, it, it can explode. I mean, you know, it, it shouldn't be confused that he said benign, uh, in, uh, uh, banal are not the same. This is not a benign nationalism. And that's what I also try to argue in my book. You know, you, you do, shouldn't separate aggressive and banal nationalism. They are part of the same family. So precisely you know, the dominant nationalism is always this everyday banal because it's constantly reproduced. That's why it can explode. Uh, you know, these are not two different things. So, so I mean, we, see, we saw that obviously in, in the, you know, there is no Western, you know, the, the distinction between civil and ethnic has been questioned for many years. So saying the Western nationalism is some sort of a, uh, you know, cuddly, nice nationalism, that's not the case. We saw that in the US with Brexit and everything, how easily these things can explode. So I, I this distinction is really, uh, not very useful in, in that sense of you know distinction between Eastern and Western. So so that would be my response. I don't know what was the third question. I 
the third question was about uh, income inequalities and whether they uh, delegitimize the nationalist project or strengthen it. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it depends again on the context. They, they can be used and they have already been used very much to, so instead of talking about, you know, issues such as jobs and blah, 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 you talk about, you know, enemies and project these, these problems. But nationalism can be strengthened, like in the case of Denmark or, or Finland or Iceland or kind of these economically uh, prosperous societies where, where nationalism is kind of more embedded, uh, but, but kind of prosperity brings brings uh, a more attachment to the, to the state. I mean, this is Gellner's point. Gellner's point was that there are two sources for legitimacy in modernity, uh, economic growth and nationalism. So if you have these two combined, you're a prosperous state. So you cannot get rid of nationalism. It's just a question of what kind of nationalism it will be, you know, how you can con contain it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna take a, another set of questions. Um, and uh, the first one is from, um, Nicola Minazzi, who is the Italian ambassador to Bosnia and Herzegovina. And he's asking, would not a renewed call for brotherhood and unity of Yugoslav times be a useful bridge to the EU? Uh, what went wrong with that and how to re-evaluate re it? Uh, Florian, I'd like you to take this one. Um, and then a related sort of question about alternatives uh, is from Denisa Kostovicheva uh, from the LSE. Um, who says, given your views on nationalism, what can you tell us about political and social forms and space of anti-nationalism? And how might this have changed since the, 19, the early 1990s? This is to all speakers. And finally, uh, um, Peter Frostad uh, from Kings and um, LSE, uh, what kinds of changes do ne need to be made to democratic institutions? at the local, regional, and national levels to make citizens feel as though their voice matters. Um, so this is, these are the sort of three questions around alternatives and, and possibilities. I wonder if Florian, you might wanna take those. Uh, thanks a lot, Jasna. Uh, first to answer uh, Ambassador Minasi's question, I think, I mean, it, it kind of also addresses the other questions is, you know, what are the alternatives to, to nationalism? And, and I mean, even the terminology already betrays the difficulties because, uh, you know, anti-nationalism doesn't suggest what it is, it just suggests what it isn't or what it is against. And I mean, with the disappearance of Yugoslavia, there, you know, which, you know, had some ability to identify other than ethno-nationalist, to have a state identity, let's say, there wasn't an alternative. And we see this also in the, in the identity categories. You cannot be a Croat of Croatia uh, in a census or in the public discourse without being assumed that you are Croatian in the sense of ethnic belonging, and the same is the case in Serbia. And even in Bosnia, uh, you know, yes, there are many Bosnians, but if you look at the census results, there are very few Bosnians in Bosnia. I mean, there are lots of, there are lots of Bosniaks and Serbs and Croats, but this identity character uh, kind of criteria of Bosnian is not that widely accepted, although this is maybe a place where you could identify with the state without having the immediate label of a nation attached to it, the, the claim of a, but otherwise, again, you cannot be, I mean, it's hard to be an Albanian and Macedonian to say I'm Macedonian. Macedonian. Um, and I think this is the difficulty of how do you define an alternative? And this, uh, you know, you could say I'm European, but that uh, seems a bit kind of trite and also problematic when you're outside of the European Union. Of course, non-EU citizens are also Europeans, but as an identity category, it's hard to see how one can belong to something which is often defined exclusively for a project which you're not part of. So I think this is the difficulty is that Brotherhood and Unity is a, it was had also these, I think, as, 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 as Dan said, also very strong Marxist ideological connotation. It's how it couldn't be rescued as easily from that particular historical episode. Um, so I think this is the difficulty. What are the what is the language of non-nationalism? Um, and I think th there we, we, we're having a gap. Um, and maybe Europeanness is an is an alternative, but it's 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 a bit too broad and vague um, to really offer the kind of concrete identification which people might like to see and again also this Europeanness has also been claimed by nationalists I mean it's not that you can you know you can be very a very good Hungarian or Croatian or German nationalist and see yourself as European defending it against uh, the Muslim invaders as uh, the far right in their discourse do so um, I think this is the difficulty is is how do you how do you capture and I think the, the, the space 
has evaporated. And this is why this is this, I mean, what Sinisha has been argue of this kind of the idea that we're living in a nationalist world where, where this is the reality. So you can redefine the nation. So I think this is more the, this, the arena where this competition takes place of how do you, how permissive, exclusionary and violent do you define your national identity? Do you see I'm a Croat, but that means I can accept citizens of different faith and uh, mother tongue in that nation, or do I define it exclusionary? And this is where most of the debates take place in the kind of other ones are maybe supplementary layers, but not alternatives in the in the in the everyday lived experience of most most people. Thanks. Anyone else would like to weigh in on these questions? Okay. All right. So we'll um, we'll move on to the next set of questions. I have a question here from Neil Gandhi from the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and. He asks, what is the likelihood of nationalism moving from bark to bite? And what are the ways to reduce this nationalism towards bark? So considering that you use this, um, <laughs> this uh, quote, uh, Sinisha, why don't you give this a go? And, um, and then if anyone else wants to weigh in. Um, so that's the first question. Okay. Um, uh, then I will take, a, uh, there's a question from, um, Nenad Zakoshek uh, from the University of Zagreb, um, who says, um, again, this is a question now for all speakers. Do you see a difference in dynamics of nationalism in Southeast European countries that have completed state building, such as Slovenia and Croatia, and those countries where state building is still open, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, Kosovo, North Macedonia? So that's the second um, question. And um, sorry, I, there was another question that I, um, ah, yes. Um, so there is a question from Sam Pryke, Wolverhampton University. Does the beginning of the passing of the Yugoslav generation um, have any significance for the region? Or was Yugo nostalgia, born of a common culture and appreciation of the benefits of the common federal state, never really something that had real political significance, only a curiosity anyway? So this is a question on sort of the, the, the legacies of Yugoslavism in the region. Um, so let's start with, with Sinisha and then um, move on to uh, Dan and Florian. Okay, so, so the distinction between the barking and biting, <laughs> obviously it's a metaphor, <laughs> but it can capture many different things. One, one is uh, barking in, in this particular case indicates weakness. You know, essentially you, you cannot achieve certain things and there, therefore you, you are very aggressive. So, so it is a sign of insecurity. And, and we can kind of contrast that again with the example of maybe some nationalisms like Finnish or Danish which is biting, but more in, in terms of sort of a nationalist attitude towards the immigrants. So in a sense, you don't have to do any, anything, but you introduce certain restrictive measures and you know, kind of police people in a particular way, which might be a, a particular form of biting nationalism, which is not necessarily good. But you can use biting metaphor, obviously, for explosion of nationalism in times of war, uh, you know, and that obviously what, what has happened with, with once the Yugoslav state when it, when it collapsed. Uh, so, so, I mean, these, they may not necessarily be a good thing that you move from one to another. It's just, I think they're useful metaphors in kind of trying to uh, organize these ideas and see what's happening in particular society. Uh, the, the, the second question about the U Yugoslav generation, I think that's a very good question in a sense. It's worth uh, uh, exploring this, doing some really kind of proper uh, sociological research to see uh, you know, how young generation uh, see this legacy. And, and I imagine a lot of this has to do with the family traditions. You know, people are very much aligned, you know, their family. I mean, this is like third or fourth generation of people who fought in, in the second war on different sides uh, tend to be, you know, uh, more sympathetic or more hostile to Yugoslav uh, heritage. Uh, so, so obviously, you know, generation that grew up in, in uh, Yugoslav times uh, like Dan and myself, I don't know, yes, <laughs> we're around. You know, we, we do obviously have all these kind of memories and we know exactly what was happening, but the new generation, you know, they, they might build these kinds of uh, a sense of what this was, which can be kind of idealized 
as, as a form of Yugo nostalgia. Uh, but, but, but you know, we also encounter a lot of kind of interaction between young people, you know, across across these these societies. So there are groups which are very hostile because they often are part of these families which have a very different understanding of, of the Yugoslav times. And then you have this third or fourth generation who grew up in, you know, kind of having a, this uh, positive attitude towards that period, and they continue to do that. Uh, I, I, I mean, obviously, this is something that has to be explored properly to see how this works. But it is an interesting thing. I don't think once the, the this older generation dies out that the, this whole project will disappear. I think it will still be there in a different way. Um, Dan, maybe you would like to yes. come in. Yes, right. Um... The new gener the uh, bark to bite uh, aspect. Um, I think the, uh, the the nationalism, but that goes for any other doctrine or ideology or political program, gets has a potential of getting dangerous when there is a collapse of uh, the state and or of international order, and uh, especially when it happens at the same time, which is which was happening in Yugoslavia in 1989. And I think this brief moment of anarchy and chaos was very dangerous. And even uh, weak new alternative ideologies and a relatively small number of uh, people following them uh, it, with extreme views and intentions uh, managed to be successful in circumstances like that, especially when they were tolerated and supported by um, actors which were uh, willing to provide weaponry, um, which is, uh, I think, precondition for starting a serious bite. Um, and I think this is what we had. We had actually collapsing of international order in Europe. We had collapsing of Yugoslav state. We also had collapsing of Croatian, Bosnian, and Serbian uh, republics. Um, and we had, so therefore nobody to stop extremists. Um, and then also we had uh, various parts of the former state apparatus uh, being av becoming available to uh, various extremists and linking with, with them and arming them from within and then opening the borders from the outside. So I think these, these are the circumstances. In other circumstances, um, they can certainly be successful when it comes to discrimination, hate speech, um, violent acts against individuals and ethnic minorities and various groups, uh, migrants and, and uh, ev everyone they don't, they don't like or support. I mean, whoever they think they are, they would usually call them, uh, you know, Serbs if they are in Croatia or I don't know, whatever, Ustashi if they are in Serbia or Shiptas or something like that. They would label them ethnically even if some of these groups that are to be discriminated, although often they have nothing to do really with ethnic uh, groups, uh, just in order to insult them and to uh, link them with this big, bigger uh, narrative. But I, I can't see for as long as the state is sufficient to stop um, violence, I, I don't see this uh, really happening. Now, the new generation, um, that's an interesting question because I mean, I, uh, all of us who teach the new generation know that we now have students who uh, not only that they don't have personal memories of Yugoslavia, communism, um, but they don't even have uh, now personal memories of Milosevic. And, uh, and that, so this is like students born in 2000, you know, now they, they don't really, that's the, that's the history, that's a history for them. It's not for us, of course, but it is for them. And uh, I think there is a difference. I mean, from a personal experience of teaching both in Zagreb and Belgrade, I think there is a, a slight difference in between these two uh, cases, because in Croatia, Yugoslavia was over 30 years ago. And so therefore, I think we really now have a new generation for a while, which was born after Yugoslavia and uh, largely educated and taught uh, by, by in, in a schools and so on and so forth negatively of Yugoslavia. And they are, now in a, they are now in a situation that when they really want to find some alternatives to the dominant narratives, they uh, also look at the Yugoslav experience as a source of inspiration for alternatives, some of them. They also go further in the past, so they, they look to Endeha, for example, as well. So we have this, you know, the, the uh, Ustashophilia, but also Yugoslavophilia in a way, as a form of resistance to the dominant, overwhelmingly supported state organized and imposed narratives. Uh, so 
and also ideological differences. We, we have, you know, right wing rising, but also left wing rising in a way in this new generation, I think. When it comes to Serbia, however, I think this distance from Yugoslavia was, this is a shorter period of time. And so, for example, Yugoslavia for um, uh, uh, young students in Serbia really ended in 2006, not before that. And I think this is still the early stages, early, early uh, period. Uh, I, I see the difference after 2012 with uh, Vucic coming to power and basically reshaping the national identity uh, for Serbia that would be as far, as, as much detached um, from Yugoslavia as possible. So what we see now is like building monuments to Stefan Nemanja and, and the Serb Serbianizing the Yugoslav history somehow, right? Especially during the Second, as the Second World War and, and so on and so forth. And uh, I, I think we, we now really are in this phase, which I think in Croatia was, um, was actually in, it happened, let's say 1997, 1999, 2000 maybe, uh, but not after that. I think what's also interesting is how the Croatian state now uh, faced with a new generation of people who have no memory of the homeland war, the, you know, the big myth that organizes Croatian national identity now, how they try to uh, transfer that narrative onto the new generation. And I see some interesting parallels with the Yugoslav communists who were trying to do this back in 68, 70 through you know, new generation wave of films and, and music and monuments and stories and educational programs. I think the Croatian nationalists are doing the same because they are a little bit worried about the, you know, how the new generation will respond to old stories. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Florian, would you like to add anything here or would you, because um, there's a number of questions here that I think will... Let's take a few more questions if we can. Okay, so um, there are lots of excellent questions, by the way, I cannot possibly um, get through all of them, but there have been a number of questions about um, the influence of the external environment. Um, and uh, so, for example, Nada Zecevic from Goldsmiths asks, um, how do you assess the influence from abroad to the reinforcement of the region's neo-nationalisms? So that's a, a general question. Then there are more um, specific questions about, um, uh, by, for example, Luisa Riberi, who is a graduate student in the, uh, at the LSE, uh, she asks, following High Representative Insko's remarks at the Security Council last month on the concrete risk of a new partition or disintegration of Bosnia in the coming years, how likely is this scenario uh, to take place? And should the international community or the UN or NATO or all, I suppose, intervene again in the region and how should they do this? So in terms of, of policy um, and um, uh, then there is uh, Damir Vucevic, uh, who is at the University of Illinois, uh, who has a question again um, about the recent proliferation of non-papers. And he asks, in your views, what is the international community more likely to support? Status quo, redrawing of borders, mini Schengen, or something else? So we're looking at the um, basically the impact of external environment and actors, both um, you know, in the sort of recent past and also in terms of policy and future um, uh, policy. So um, we have five more minutes. So I would propose to end with a sort of a roundup on uh, these questions around external actors and, and policy implications. So um, Florian, would you like to start on that, please? Yes, sure. Thanks, Jasna. Yes, I mean, I think, let me answer this in two ways. I mean, one is, the international order or the European order in the system which we're talking about, which was established at the end of the wars, which was primarily about uh, recognizing uh, Republican borders and not engaging in new territorial boundary making. Kosovo, the partial exception as not being a republic but a province, but still no internal boundaries uh, were, you know, kind of created. And the idea of kind of squaring the circle between the claim of nation states and still trying to keep states somewhat multinational and multi-ethnic. Um, and this was the paradigm of the last, you know, decades really. And so in that sense, it, it kind of hawks back to what, what Dan was saying. It, the question is how, how 
permissible is the environment seen by those who would like to redraw the borders or to certainly create more homogenous nation states or new nation states, how much do they see it's possible or are they waiting? Um, so there's this kind of, this is the question. Um, and I don't think there's the willingness of international actors to let go of this order. They are of course, challengers and uh, we see them who would like to see this uh, question but uh, uh, the question is more is the is the current system collapsing um like it did in 1989 where we had a recalibration of global power i don't i don't see it yet happening of course it's much more gradual process of reshifting of power relations but i don't think it's going to pay, pay out in southeastern europe with such a strength considering also the the the, this, the existence and I, I, i'm quite confident the survival of the european union the second part of that question is the question of ideas and i think there it's more about what is this europe based on and there of course we do have a competition over ideas uh, you know we have um, a much more let's say nationalist uh, isolationist view of Europe, which, you know, echoes in the region as well, and which again can work as an encouragement. I don't think this is necessarily going to change the borders of the region, but it does show that, of course, it always keeps this door open. And I think this is what I'm trying to say, was trying to say in the beginning, it's not the, the next tensions and conflict is not going to be a reiteration of the 1990s um, because as Dan said there aren't the weapons around today as they were in the 1990s there isn't the kind of larger international context around but I think this kind of attempt of undoing uh, the, the order the kind of post-war order at the seams is something which seems quite possible and I don't see the kind of um, uh, more vibrant liberal uh, world order uh, represented by what has been called the international community, which long ago doesn't exist anymore, really standing up to protect it, at least in places where it might feel like it can live with uh, a gradual erosion. And I think this is maybe the biggest potential for, for uh, you know, this gradual erosion uh, in the region. Thank you. Sinisha, would you like to go second and then we'll conclude with Dan? Okay. I mean, I'm, this is not my expertise, sort of. <laughs> yes, I know. But, but I, I mean, obviously, the kind of geopolitical context matters a great deal. It influences domestic politics and, and the way what how, how the political parties and leaders can play out. I mean, and, and, and what, everything what Florian said makes complete sense to me uh, in, in, in terms of you don't really have a hegemon in, in, in kind of as you used to before, and now you have big influence of other powerful states like China, like now obviously Turkey, Russia, um, EU in, in, a, in a kind of uh, weakened uh, situation after Brexit, and then potentially the UK as an independent actor. So all of these will play an important part in, in, in how nationalism develops in the region, and, uh, but it will be more, more diverse. Uh, you know, the future is much, much uh, less predictable now than it was maybe 15, 20 years ago. Thank you, Dan. And I'm afraid this is going to be the final intervention of and, the evening. <laughs> and, and, and a very short one. Well, I'm very critical of how the European Union, and in particular some states, including in the first place Germany, acted in 1990, 1991. Uh, now they were solving their own problem with unification and disappearance of the state and that sort of things. So of course, they were, yeah, why should they think about the impact of that somewhere else? And the impact, unfortunately, it seems to, be, to me to be quite negative. Uh, however, I think the uh, solution today is uh, to continue with the presence of the um, external actors, particularly European Union, which is the only political organization that could actually turn some of these ob you know, states that feel they are objects into semi-subjects uh, within the European Union and offer them through membership in the European Union uh, guarantees for safety and survival. I mean, that's what they would, that's how they would see the membership of the, in the European Union. And I think it should happen to all countries at the same time immediately. And I think it would be a good way to limit their national sovereignty. Limitation of national sovereignty in a post-war period is a good thing. And I think that that is, uh, it, it, so therefore I think the European Union can still, if it wants to, be an anti-war actor, which is something that originally it was it planned to be, in fact. Okay, well, that's it. 6.30 on the dot. Thank you very much. Um, there are many, many other questions. In fact, we have about 40 questions altogether and comments, um, if you want to have a look. 
but our discussion this evening is now finished. Um, and I would like to reiterate my thanks to all three of you. It's been an absolutely fantastic panel and discussion, and I have personally learned a lot, and I'm sure our, our um, spectators have as well. Um, I encourage you to read all their books and, and um, recent outputs, um, and uh, good evening to all. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Right. Th thank you, Yasna. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night.